Thursday, we were talking about the um, relationship that exists between slavery and cotton and the fact that one of the reasons that Georgia uh, began to expand One of the reasons Georgia began to expand economically and in terms of political importance was because of cotton. And the average cotton bale weighed how much? 500 pounds. So um, cotton sold for about 38 cents a pound in 1790. By 1860, that has dropped to 13 cents a pound, but production is almost 3.9 million. And so roughly there's $247 million worth of cotton produced in 1860. If you put that in today's dollars, it's about $8.25 billion with a B. And so that was a lot of money. And that's one of the reasons why um, those in the South who supported slavery wanted to continue slavery. So it is King Cotton. It's one of the reasons Georgia becomes um, so economically um, important and politically important as well. Whose is this? Whose is this? Put your name on it. All right. So the second reason is the growth of the railroad. Um, Cotton, again, is the driving force behind the development of the railroad in Georgia. Um, there's cotton. You have to get that cotton to market. The only way to get it to market, the only way to get it to Savannah before 1834 was by wagon. And you're not going to get an awful lot of cotton um, on a wagon. Um, you could put it on the river, but you had to have a boat. that was either a flat boat or a steamboat. Pretty slow, pretty dangerous, um, pretty expensive. Steamboats tended to blow up, or they could blow up. They did often blow up. And, uh, of course, that destroyed your cotton and wasn't too good for the people that were on the steamboat. Uh, But in 1834, the railroad comes to Georgia. 1834, um, Georgia begins building what becomes known as the Georgia Railroad. And it basically extended from Athens to Augusta. And so now people have a way to get their cotton to Augusta, particularly if they're in the northern part of the state. Um, And then by 1860, they have constructed over 1,200 miles of railroad in Georgia. Now, let me ask you this question. 1860, there's 1,200 miles, over 1,200 miles of railroad in Georgia. By 1865, how much railroad exists in Georgia? Just guess. 2,400. No, no, 8,640. Zero. Zero. Why? What happens between 1860 and 1865? What? The Civil War comes. What does Sherman... What does Sherman do as he comes through Georgia? He destroys the railroad. He cuts off the lifeblood of Georgia and the Confederacy by destroying the railroad. That's another story for another day. But just to give you an idea of how important the railroad had become, it's not just about transporting cotton. It's about transportation in general. Um Here's a little map, and that is not from 1860. It's not from the, don't think it's from the 19th century. But it does give you an idea of railroad coverage in Georgia. Every little town would have had a railroad depot. Every little town would have access, if not in the town, then pretty close by. Um, The map over there. On uh, above the the whiteboard there is from 1895. It's after the Civil War, of course. Um, but the interesting thing is, when you look at it, there are no interstates. 
There are no roads on that map. But what you see are railroads. Well, if you were to pull it down and look at it, you would see little squiggly lines. Those little squiggly lines are railroads. Um, I would pull it down, but it's from 1895. Don't some of y'all touching it. All right. So we have King Cotton. We have the growth of the railroads. And the final thing that propels Georgia into um, this position of importance is Atlanta. And we have to go back and talk about the railroads again because the railroad is really the only reason that Atlanta came to exist. 1838, the Georgia General Assembly approves the construction of the Western and Atlantic Railroad. It is supposed to run from Ross's Landing up near Chattanooga um, down to a little place called Terminus. Its purpose was to kind of connect Georgia and Tennessee, the Chattahoochee River and the Tennessee River. Also, these railroads that ran out of Augusta, Macon, Columbus, and Milledgeville are all now going to be gathered at a central point. Again, Ross is landing in the north near Chattanooga and a small railroad depot called Terminus near the Chattahoochee River. That's where it ended. And that third bullet, probably ought to fix it, says the Western Atlantic Railroad began in the north in Ross's Landing near Chattanooga, and it ended, is what it should say, at a small railroad depot called Terminus. So you could write that in. It ended at a small railroad depot called Terminus. And that makes sense. Something terminates, what does that mean? It ends. Okay. If something is terminal, a terminal degree, a terminal illness, that means that'll be the end, right? Um, so terminus to Ross's Landing or Ross's Landing to terminus. Um, within five years, we have two more railroads that converge or come together at terminus. And because of that, this little depot grows into a town, and it grows into a rapidly growing town. In 1843, they changed the name of Terminus to Marthasville. Where are you from? Marthasville, Georgia. Hope you like it. Marthasville is named after the daughter of George Lumpkin, or Wilson Lumpkin, rather. He's the governor of Georgia, and he was also very instrumental in getting the Western Atlantic Railroad built. Um, so they named the city of Terminus Marthasville. Well, by 1845, Lumpkin is no longer the governor of Georgia, and Marthasville is no longer a fitting name for what has become the largest or one of the largest cities in Georgia, certainly the fastest growing, and one that is quickly becoming the South's most important city. And by 1860, it is arguably the most important city in the South. It's either Atlanta or Richmond, Virginia. And most people would say, <coughs> excuse me, yes would um, say that Atlanta is important because um, of the railroads and of the industry that we find in Georgia. So, three things that lead to Georgia's growth, uh, politically and economically. Um, the city of Atlanta itself, its founding and its growth, um, the railroad, the growth of the railroad, and then King Cotton. Those are three things that lead to Georgia's um, development. All right, let me give you these. Gosh, I hope I have enough. I don't. I don't know why I don't have enough. So let me 
give some of you these. And then I shall give you a moment and I shall go and make copies. Um, how about being quiet? You are on video. So please um, behave. In fact, Joyce, would you come with me for a moment, please? I'm just going to start these. If you would, when they get finished, if you bring them to me. All right. Yeah, well, it's your, uh, your classmates. I know. All right, so about, about the same time, about the same time that Georgia is moving westward, we see this push to remove the Indians. And so we, we talk about westward expansion, but at the same time we talk about westward expansion, we have to talk about Indian removal. So for a period of about 60 years, from 1776 to 1835, we have this removal of the Indians from Georgia. At first, it is, along with westward expansion, it is pushing the Indians, the Creek and the Cherokee, further and further west, particularly the Creek Indians. Um, Georgia grows, and as Georgia grows, it grows which way? West. Well, that's where most of the Indians move. And so as Georgians move away from the coastal regions, um, into the back country, um, into the interior of Georgia, they have more and more contact with the Native Americans. Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's not. And in fact, more often, it is not okay. Um, it is not positive, particularly for the Native Americans. Georgia has um, Native Americans that belong to two great nations. There were two Native American nations in Georgia. Um, the Creek, they were also known as the Muscogee. Um, and their nation was the larger of the two. You can see the red oval stretches from basically the coast um, all the way into what is current day Mississippi. Um, south of Atlanta to the Georgia-Florida line is basically where the Creek Nation was located. And then you had the Cherokee. So the Creek or the Muscogee and the Cherokee. And the Muscogee, uh, or excuse me, the Cherokee Primarily North Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee. Much smaller nation, but in many ways much more advanced. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. The Creek and Cherokee are part of five Native American nations that were considered to be civilized. Civilized because they had European names. They had a Native American name 
um, He Who Wanders a Lot, Standing Bear, Little Hawk, you know, whatever their um, Cherokee or Creek name was, but then they took European names as well. Uh, They adopted, they bought into, they became a part of white culture. Or you could say American culture. But probably white culture because you had Indians that were slave owners, that owned farms um, and bought and sold slaves. They went to American schools, so they're being educated as Americans. And they're Christian. So they are considered to be civilized. What's happened is those Europeans who came in 1733 into Georgia brought with them their culture. And over the next hundred years, um, that culture rubs off on the Native American tribes that are there, the Native American nations, the Creek and the Cherokee. All right. Uh, those European names, you're going you're gonna to see some names in just a few minutes um, that if I didn't show you a picture, you would never think they were Native American just based on their name. That's how European their names were. Um, the Creek are really the first to go. They're, they're the first that Georgians feel have to go. But you have to look back at the history of... Um, the relationship between Georgians and, I don't know what y'all are giggling about. I'm sure it's something infantile. It means you're being like a child, like a baby. Um, sorry. Just had to write down Aiden Ham. Lordy, he needs a haircut. Um, So we go back to the early history of Georgia, 1733. The Creeks and the Georgians meet with one another, or they meet one another. They become, um, they actually become friends. Tomachichi and Oglethorpe become friends, and that causes the people of Georgia and the Creek nation to become friends as well. It's a relationship based on those two people, the Yamacraw, are actually a part of the Creek Nation. They are a tribe within the Creek Nation. And so, based on the relationship between Tomachichi and Oglethorpe, um, everything's good between the Creek and Georgians until it's not. Um, this is part of the freeze that is in the U.S. rotunda, the Capitol rotunda. It goes all the way around the rotunda. It starts with the founding of Jamestown, and it goes all the way around the rotunda till you get to the birth of flight with Orville and Wilbur Wright. One of the things depicted, give you an idea of how important Georgia is in U.S. history, is the founding of Georgia by James Oglethorpe. This is Oglethorpe seated in the chair. You can see Tomachichi back here in the back. Everybody remembers what he looks like. He's standing directly behind that woman. That woman is... She is not naked. What's her name? Mary Musgrove. Thank you, Aiden. Um, And she is pointing to that eagle, which has some significance. I don't know. I don't know. Um, And so... Initially, this relationship is a good relationship. It's beneficial to both sides until it's not. Um, Tomachichi dies. Tomachichi dies. Uh, he's in his 90s. Again, he and Oglethorpe have been very close. Oglethorpe is forced to return to England. He never comes back to Georgia. And because of that, their relationship the relationship between the creek and Georgia begins to deteriorate. It falls apart. It's kind of like if you have a friend group and there's one person who's at the center of that group and everything kind of revolves around him. You know, he's the one that's always making people laugh. He, you know, gets you together for outings. Um, You know, he's the life of the party. 
and that person leaves. And then suddenly, there's nobody there doing all those things. And so your relationship with that friend group uh, might fall apart. It gets weaker, particularly, or certainly. Um, An example of this relationship and how far it digressed is Mary Musgrove. Now, without her, Georgia would not exist, or it wouldn't have existed as a colony because of the communication barrier that would have existed between the Yamacraw and Oglethorpe. For 23 years, from 1737 to 1760, Mary Musgrove sued the colony of Georgia. Tomachichi had given her land, land claims, and Georgia never followed through on those land claims. And so she sued. Um, Georgia will not give up the land, and this causes her kinfolk, who are the Creek Indians, to become rather angry. Remember, Musgrove is half English, half Creek, or half Yamacraw. And so they, they stick up for their relative. Her people speak up for her. And that causes further dissension, further disagreement. It begins to come to a head just prior to the Revolutionary War. The leaders of Georgia are beginning to put pressure on the Creeks to cede or to give up. Large amounts of land to Georgia. And again, what does this do? It pushes the creek further and further westward. In fact, you can see on the map, 1733 to 1805, that kind of peach color there. This would be the land that is ultimately given away under the headright system and the first land lottery in 1805. 1814, that darker color, uh, peach is heated, given up by the, uh, the Creek Indians. And finally, between 1818 and 1832, you have the rest of the Creek land ceded to Georgia or to the U.S. government. So really in a period of, what, 99 years, 100 years, after their initial contact with um, the English, the Creek Indians are no longer in Georgia. Revolutionary War comes in 1775, 1776, and there's not a lot of fighting that takes place in Georgia. You know that. Um, But the Creek side with the British for good reason. What have the Georgians been trying to do? get rid of them, push them west, get them out of Georgia. The British are, maybe they're lying to them, I don't know, but they're saying, you know, we'll give you back your land if you support um, support the king. The war ends, and you have all these Creek Indians who fought for the British, and of course, that causes some distrust. I mean, you go to war, and your enemy's going to live in your backyard. How much are you going to trust him? You're not. And so the Georgians begin to call more and more for the removal of the Creek from Georgia. One of the leaders of the Creek Indians was a guy named Alexander McGilvery. Now, you see that name, and what do you think? White guy. Old white guy, probably. Well, that's Alexander McGilvery. He was Creek. And during the Revolutionary War, he actually was a colonel in the British Army. Um, And he may have taught Elijah Clark a thing or two about guerrilla warfare, because that's how he fought. Uh, They raided Whig settlements in Georgia and Tennessee. Um, They were terrorists, if we were to use today's terminology. They're trying to, to create terror, to cause terror and cause fear, terror in people's lives. War ends, McGilvery survives the war, and after that, he becomes the driving force behind um, the Creeks' attempts to have the United States identify them or recognize them as a nation and also to respect their boundaries. 
Does it work? We'll see. 1790. So seven years after the end, seven years after the Treaty of Paris is written, signed. McGilvery agrees to cede all creek lands to Georgia east of the Oconee River. So what we call that on the other side of the river there is the trans ogeechee land. Ogeechee. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So McGilvery agrees to give up that land. And in exchange, President Washington agrees to recognize the Creek Nation. They're an independent, sovereign nation. And to become an ally, to defend them against their enemies. It's a pretty good deal for the Creek Indians, right? You would think so. And they also, Washington recognizes McGilvery as the national leader of the Creeks. So, three things. Recognition, protection, national leader. Pretty good deal. Does it last? Mm, no. Did President Washington lie? Mm, no. By the time, by the time this falls apart, Washington is dead and he couldn't have done anything about it anyway. Um, so what happens is this. You should. Um, it, if you uh, if you've ever been on Kings Road, right across Kings Road from the drive-through liquor store, you find you find this particular um, Georgia historical marker, and it and it says five miles south of this point is the rock landing at the head of navigation on the Oconee River, and at the junction of old Indian trading paths leading westward. In 1789, President Washington sent General Benjamin Lincoln here to treat with Chief Alexander McGilvery and 2,000 Creek warriors and settle the Georgia Creek controversy over cession of the trans ogeechee lands. Here also is the official resident, residence of James Seagrove, appointed, in the first US Indian, appointed the first U.S. Indian agent to the Creeks in September 1791. He distributed in 1792 from this point $13,000 worth of government food to Creek suffering from crop failure. To put that in perspective, that's $382,000 worth of food today. So it's a lot of, a lot of food then, a lot of food now. So just, just across the river and about five miles south is where Lincoln, sent by General Washington, President Washington, meets with Alexander McGilvery to negotiate the treaty that gives all the land west of the Oconee um, to Georgia, okay? Um, 1790, those promises are made. But in 1795, it comes to light that some people in Georgia have been doing some no-no things, particularly when it came to the land of the Yazoo Territory. So the Yazoo land fraud of 1795 comes to light. Georgia sued. They can't pay their, their uh, settlements. They asked the government to pay them, the U.S. government to pay them. They do. And they also asked the U.S. to um, remove the Creek and Cherokee from Georgia. We'll give you the Yazoo Territory, but you got to get rid of the um, Indians that live around here as well. And in 1803, the city of Milledgeville is created, at least on paper, and what was here in 1803? What was west of the Oconee River? Indians. Indians. Okay. And so, um, 1825 rolls along, 20 years later. Governor George Troop has a first cousin. You done. You know, it's about three times we've gone through this now. Noah's mother. You probably ought to whoop him tonight. Good. 
although obviously it hadn't done much good. Um, Governor Troop, his first cousin is actually Chief William McIntosh. Again, good European name, Scottish name. Don't know if he was kin to Lachlan McIntosh, although probably was. Um, but Troop persuades his cousin to make a deal with the U.S. government, to give up the creek lands in return for um, money. So in 1825, William McIntosh signs the Treaty of Indian Springs. Anybody know where Indian Springs is? No. It's actually a um, little bit south of Jackson, Georgia. If you've ever been to Jackson, um, you've probably seen signs for Indian Springs State Park. What? No, it is not. Um, and under this treaty, McIntosh gives up all the remaining creek lands in Georgia. William McIntosh benefits greatly from the Treaty of Indian Springs. Georgia benefits greatly from the Treaty of Indian Springs. The only people that don't benefit is the Creek Nation. McIntosh himself does, but the Creek Nation does not. This is William McIntosh again. Um, you know, you just saw his name, you would think guy of Scottish descent. Um, but he is, he is an Indian. He's a Native American. He is a Creek Indian. This, <clears throat> this is the Treaty of Indian Springs. You can see John Quincy Adams' name across the top, President of the United States of America. Um, and again, this, this is entered into in 1825. Um, the Creek are not happy with William McIntosh. And so they fire William McIntosh as their chief. Problem is, the only way to do that is to kill William McIntosh. And so um, 200 Creek Indians set his house on fire. He, of course, runs out of his house. He is beaten to death by 200 Creek Indians. I, I'm sure everybody got a whack at him. Um, that's April 30th, 1825. By really, it says 1825. I said 1825. It's really over the next seven years, um, the Creek Indians are moved out of Georgia until um, 1832. They're all west of the Mississippi River. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is this, but another is related to something else. So the Creek are removed. The Cherokee are next. Um, the Creek, again, they're pretty much gone by 1827. They're still trying to push the rest of them out, though. Uh, but the Cherokee, on the other hand, are not only are they tolerated, they're, they're pretty well respected in North Georgia. Um, they flourish. They have a very modern society, a very modern, advanced civilization. Um, they're doing quite well in Georgia, um, not just northwest Georgia, but all of north Georgia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Again, their society is very advanced. Their civilization, their culture is very advanced. Um, the map here, you can see Calhoun. And the only reason I put Calhoun up there is because... That's where their capital was located, near Calhoun, a place called New Ecota. So they have a capital city, just like Georgia had a capital city. They have a written constitution based on the U.S. Constitution, just like the Georgia Constitution. And they are, again, they're very advanced. They're doing very well as a society. And in fact, most poor white Georgians are worse off than the Cherokee. The Cherokee nation lives better than most of the people in Georgia at the time. And that creates some animosity. That creates some jealousy. Uh, what? They had a better standard of living. Their houses were better. Their farms were better. Their lifestyle was better. Um, probably the two most famous Cherokee were George Guess 
and John Ross. We'll talk about George Guest. Um, his name was also Sequoia. That was his probably his given name. His European name, of course, is George Guest. And again, if I just give you George Guest, you're thinking white European looking guy. Um, but George Guest, pretty smart fella. He creates the Cherokee writing system. Um, he creates an alphabet. Their language, of course, had been spoken, but until he comes along, no one had ever written it down. So he creates an alphabet and he creates their, their written um, language. And so after he does that, the Cherokee are able to read and write in their own language. And that's one thing that separated them from most Georgians. They could read and write. They were literate. Yeah, well, they just, people didn't know how to read and write. Um, this summer, Miss Karen actually ordered this for me off of Amazon. We had seen it in the gift shop at uh, Unicoi State Park. Uh, it's out of print. And so she ordered, but she was able to order it off of um, Amazon. And it is a um, a collection of Cherokee words with pictures. Huh? Kind of. It doesn't have a lot of pictures in it, but it's got a few. Uh, but it does have words like um, bad looking, barbershop, big spoon, Cherokee Nation. What's the name? What's the word for bad looking? Bad looking. Uhoi daika no dai. Anyway, um, if y'all want to take a look at that, you can grab it before you leave, or it'll be there the rest of the week. Um, so an alphabet. Here's George Guess or Sequoia. Um, you, shh, you have um, probably heard of him. Um, on the left is the Georgia, or excuse me, the Cherokee Constitution um, in the Cherokee language, and of course, there's Sequoia or George Guest with his syllabary, uh, which which was used to create this written um, language for the Cherokee Nation, and that's important because now they can um, they have written contracts. They um, actually publish their own newspaper called the Cherokee Phoenix. Um, they can enter written treaties with other nations. Um, and in fact, in 1791, the U.S. signs a treaty with the Cherokee Nation, and it guarantees that it will respect and protect the Cherokee Nation. It identifies them. It recognizes them as an independent Cherokee Nation or as an independent country. And, and it actually takes... And it lasts until it doesn't. There's the Cherokee Phoenix. Um, and the Cherokees and the Georgians really lived side by side peacefully until 1828. Gold is discovered. And Dahlonega, that causes the first U.S. gold rush. And suddenly, the Cherokee Nation, which was pretty much worthless to the white Georgian becomes worth something. Uh, this is from 1909. It shows you the gold deposits um, in Georgia. And you can see those two thick black lines that run through Habersham, Lumpkin, White, um, Dawson counties. That would be um, where the Cherokee lived. Thousands pour into Dahlonega. Their idea is to strike it rich. But again, the Cherokee Nation is a sovereign nation. These people are trespassing. This land does not belong to those people. And so, uh, more and more pressure is put on the Cherokee to give up their land. There's a treaty signed in 1835. Um, you'll read a little bit about that tomorrow. Um, 
things just don't work out for the Cherokee Nation because of greed. And that becomes a, a dominant, that plays a dominant role in Georgia history um, until, hey, sure, until 1861 when the Civil War breaks up. So ultimately the Cherokee are forced to give up their land. Uh, but there's a, there's a process that takes place. 1828, the Georgia General Assembly, General, or excuse me, Governor George Gilmer declares that Georgia state laws are in effect in the Cherokee Nation. That's like Mexico going into Texas and saying Mexican law is now in effect in Texas. It, it just doesn't work that way. 1830, President Andrew Jackson signs the Indian Removal Act. And that requires that all Indians east of the Mississippi move to reservations that are west of the Mississippi. And we'll pick that up tomorrow.